So, the last few Amphibia episodes were good. Quite good, actually. They were probably the best Amphibia episodes that have taken place on Earth thus far. I found Temple Frogs especially affecting for its demonstrations of the close links between Anne's mother and her community and how those communal links have kept her sane and kept her together during the months wherein Anne was gone. Of course, they're not perfect. They still feel a little safe, a little low stakes, a little unwilling to confront the real darkness unleashed by the end of last season. And I will say that the robot that keeps chasing them is getting quite tiring already as an antagonist. And even if I do like these episodes, I will fully admit that there is not much about them that could serve to make a good, solid video that would be able to analyze the show effectively in 10 or 15 minutes. I don't think I'd have that much material. The one exception is the little bit of lore we get that becomes quite a significant plot point in these episodes. Or is it? We'll have to see. It seems like it's going to be a major plot point, but then they kind of undermine that in a way, as though they're playing with the audience's expectations that all this lore is going to matter. But let's dive into the lore anyway. Anne is tired and exhausted. She's still uncertain, she's still very anxious, and she's making poor decisions. She's sleep deprived, and she seems to be working herself very hard. I wonder if that's intentional to some degree to distract from what happened at the end of True Colors and the situation she's left her friends in on Amphibia. But in her sleep-addled state, she decides to go and rob a museum just to take a vessel that is from a long time ago and that displays a frog, presumably one of the planter's ancestors, coming to Earth. And this vessel appears to be from the age of the Vikings, and that would fit since... The theft of the music box apparently occurred a thousand years ago, according to Andreas. Anne and the planters could have gotten a lot of information from the museum curator had they just asked. Dr. Jan is very helpful, if a little eccentric. As some others have said, she's kind of like Marcy in a way. But Anne does not want to do that. Possibly because she has trust issues, possibly because she's so monomaniacally focused on her plan of getting the planters home on her own that she's not thinking straight. But everything manages to work out for them by the end. They do not get thrown in jail, even though they destroy a lot of priceless artifacts at the museum, and Dr. Jan is still willing to help them. At the end of the episode, she shines a black light on the vessel and reveals a secret message written in the Amphibian script. This message, we later learn, is kind of cryptic. At first, when I finished this first section of the episode, I thought that this was going to be left to the fans to decode. But instead, it comes back in the second half of the episode, right at the end, when Dr. Jan unveils the writing to Anne, and Anne can read it because she has Marcy's journal. You think having Marcy's journal would generate some sort of emotional reaction from Anne, but we don't see that. But anyway, the message is the following. Seek the mother of Olms. She will guide you to your destiny. Anne and the planters have absolutely no idea what this means, and they just laugh it off. Now, there are two very different ways in which this could be taken. 
This could be read as kind of a chastisement of fans who are so focused on the lore elements of the show that they are not as focused on the actual characters and ideas and themes and relationships and yearnings and passions of these characters and of the show. It could be that. I think that is a real possibility, especially considering the context in which this happens. What is Temple Frogs as an episode? It's an episode in which Anne and the Planters are ostensibly trying to find out more about the vessel so they can get the Planters home and hopefully, although Anne never talks about this, defeat the giant evil overlord who's threatening to take over all worlds. But the actual progression of the episode is quite different. The planters are sucked into Thai culture and these different activities and foods and language lessons and drama forms at the temple itself. It's this real place of communality where people can come together and get a sense of themselves as part of something greater than their own individual egos. But Anne basically has the same relationship to this festival-like atmosphere as a lot of teens have toward whatever culture they and their parents may belong to, and that she feels a little ambivalent toward it. And she only really understands the importance of that community outside these ritualistic forms once she realizes how helpful that community was to her mother during the time when Anne was gone. Which is good. So, the focus shifts from being on the lore to being on the sense of community. So when the lore at the end is finally revealed, it's something that none of them really understand anyway. That's kind of a clever trick, actually. If that's what they were going for, I respect that. But I'm going to talk about the lore anyway, because I think it might be useful to dive into. And let's be honest here. Anne has not had the huge breakdown or the huge reckoning with True Colors that I think a lot of us were expecting. We have not received a lot of Sasha and Marcy. If I'm going to make a video out of anything, the lore is probably the most fertile ground for exploration, so let's dive into it. What is an Ulm, exactly? Well, it's this slithering, snake-like creature. It's not the kind of thing you would be expected to know, perhaps, but we have met Ulms before. They were chasing... Sprig and Polly back in Season 2, trying to eat them. And Sprig and Polly were able to outsmart them because they worked together. Now, perhaps Sprig and Polly could bring that up. That might be helpful. And it would aid in tying Season 2 toward sort of reconciliation with Season 3. Could make those Season 2 episodes feel less disconnected. Now, do I think these alms are going to be integral to solving the grand mysteries at the heart of the season? Well, no, not really. I can't imagine that being the case, considering that these creatures looked pretty insipid and rather dull in the mind, and considering that they did not seem to be that important. It'd be kind of odd if a big part of Season 3 were to focus on them. But the emphasis isn't really on Alms, but on the mother of Alms. Now, biologically and literally speaking, the mother of Alms would just be another Alm, but then why would you phrase it like that? That'd be weird. Now, it's possible the mother of Alms could be Valeriana, who we have not seen since Season 2. She appeared once in Season 1 and once in Season 2, both in relatively important roles. I don't think it's a stretch to think that we might see her again. But if we do see her, what role is she going to play? We do see the Ulms decorating the Second Temple, where she stands guard. But 
what would it add to the show for her to be the one this cryptic saying refers to? We already know that she's associated with fate and destiny. I don't see what function it would have for the show if, oh, we have this huge mystery of who the mother of all is, who's associated with all this mystery, and then it's just the character who's already associated with the mystery and intrigue. I'd be much more interested if it's some indirect referral to the little planter ancestor who stole the box and who appears in this vessel itself. But I don't know what connection this planter could have to the inscription, to being the mother of alms. I'm kind of left befuddled there. So, I think that would be a missed opportunity if the mother of alms just refers to Valeriana. And speaking of missed opportunities, I'm a little disconcerted that we are now full four episodes into the season. Meaning, one full-length episode and then seven half-length episodes. And we have seen Sasha a grand total of once. We've seen Marcy outside of flashbacks a grand total of once. These characters were incredibly important in the back half of season two. And their storylines are at a very dramatic and haunting and disquieting place, and yet the show does not really seem to be evincing an interest at this point at going back to them. Instead, we get more of these pleasant, but relatively calm and relatively ordinary and low-stakes adventures here on Earth. I don't mind if there are low-stakes episodes here. I don't need everything to be a pure adrenaline rush or a moment of profound character revelation, but I do want to feel like these episodes are meaningful, that they are contributing to a greater understanding of the ideas of the show and of the passions and yearnings and resentments of these characters. I want to feel that these episodes matter, and I don't entirely feel that at this point. It's almost kind of blatant at this point how little attention is paid to Sasha and Marcy here on Earth. If we are going to spend so much time on Earth, I would expect Anne's other friends would be important. Sasha was relatively popular, and yet no one talks about her. The paparazzi at Anne's school only refer to her as the kid who disappeared. That's kind of weird and wild. And I hope the show is building to something dealing with the aftermath of Anne and her friends leaving, and then only Anne coming back after all this time. So anyway, thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can, and you want to see more videos like this. What do you think about that inscription? Do you think we're all attaching too much meaning to it? I imagine it's going to have some relevance to come in the show. I'd be really surprised if it's just a one-off that doesn't really have any importance to the show going forward, and it's just a red herring. But anyway, tune in soon for my next analysis. It will be coming soon. That I promise you. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.